Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Heart of Sports with Jason Springer and Jeff Cohen. We are thrilled to join you on 610 ESPN, ready to help you move into this Labor Day holiday weekend, talking about all the news in the world of sports. Jeff, this week there were boos, there were cheers, there was records set in this city. Sounds like sports. It was a, okay, where do you want to go first? The, let's, let's do the positive first. You didn't even ask me how I was. I don't really care how you are. That, that, that really hurts. We have too much to talk about today. We've got All interviews. Right. We've got John Bacon calling in at 415 to talk about his new book, Overtime, yeah. uh, his interviews with Jim Harbaugh. Got no time for my feelings. No huh? time for you, oh. Jeff. We'll, we'll find right, time. So what do you want? We'll find time later. We, but I wanted about? to say also, we got Matt Lilly calling in at 440. Yep. So you can continue your quest to have me play basketball and try out with the Bluecoats. Good luck with that. Uh, I want to talk soccer first because mm-hmm. we set a record in the city last night, almost 50,000 people at Lincoln Financial Field so close for the women's national team game. Uh, we were down there. Your thoughts on the atmosphere, what you saw, the women got a 4 nothing win. Crab went home happy. It was electric. I mean, the, the, whole, the whole game was electric. The fact that I don't know what prompted people, but all, all of a sudden everybody turned on their flashlights on their phones at the exact same time. After did, they announced the attendance. Yeah. Did you? Where was the memo? They didn't have the memo in the press box that we were supposed to do that, but somehow everybody knew to do it. It may be if you're under this age, <laughs> you know to do this, and you and I are both over that age. Oh, congratulations. <laughs> well, welcome to the other side Look, of the hill. I huh? was there with you, but uh-huh. I'm saying I, I'm just letting you know I didn't get the memo either. And I looked down and I go, oh, that looks kind of cool. <laughs> yeah, to me, what was really cool was not just because we had a chance to talk to the coach and the players afterwards. wasn't just the electricity that we all got to be part of and see, it's the fact that the players noticed it so much that they basically acknowledged there were times that they were not focused on the game because they were looking around in amazement at the number of of people that had their red jerseys and their white jerseys on. They definitely did seem to get into it. After the game, you asked Sam Mewis about the atmosphere there. Here's what she had to say. Yeah, it was awesome. Um, it, the crowd was amazing, so loud, so supportive. Um, it's always really fun for the people who are from here, like um, Carly and Julie. So it was fun to like see them and see the crowd's reaction to them and how well they both played and just they represent um, this area so well for the team. So I'm really happy for them. And it was fun for the rest of us, too. It was just a great crowd. And um, we're really excited that we set this record. And um, it's all because of the people here are so supportive. There were celebrations with eagles flying. There. Allie, Allie Long did a, a eagle soaring. She's not her even goal. A, a Philly person. She got into it. Yeah, Carly but, Lloyd did the eagle soaring. Yeah, after but you Holbo. know, we, we we got a chance to also talk to Julie Ertz, and Julie said that you know she's away from Philadelphia so much because of traveling with this team that the team is kind of there for them, and it sounds like you know that they, they all kind of pick each other up, and and Philadelphia the Eagles kind of became their. Their team is a team. That's what it sounds like. And, I mean, you could tell that the city embraced them this week. The The players were at the Phillies game. I actually got to ask Carly Lloyd. She had a special week, too. We'll talk a little more about the Eagles part of that. She went to Eagles practice and kicked a field goal that made all kinds of news. Threw out the first pitch at— she did? A little bit. We'll talk no, about I missed it. That. She threw out the first pitch at the Phillies game the other night and then scored a goal in the game on Thursday night, finishing it with an Eagle celebration. Here's what she had to say about it. You know, it's just fun to be a part of everything. It's, it's, uh, I've always been a Philly sports fan. Um, I've supported, you know, every team since I was a little girl. Um, I lived and breathed every sport. And to be a part of this, to be doing all of this, um, you know, attending Eagles practices, throwing out the first pitch the Phillies game you know I never would have thought my life would be like this so it's really really special you know it's it's amazing between the Sixers Flyers Eagles Phillies uh, the treatment that they give me is is pretty amazing and um, I'm proud to to be from Jersey I'm proud to be a Philly sports fan and hopefully uh, the Eagles get back to the Super Bowl this year that's right she's definitely a local girl and and you could tell that they were enjoying themselves here uh, you know the, the the pressure's off now. They're they're celebrating their tour. They had the World Cup trophy there. Uh, the pregame festivities were great. Let's talk about what happened during the game. Because well, not o- not only that, they had so much fun and were treated. Kudos to the Eagles because they had so much fun and they felt treated so well that as they were leaving. We noticed that every one of them had their nameplates in their hands. Uh, apparently, they, they were the nicer nameplates that they they've gotten. They said it was the nicest nameplates. They, had. they were metal. Now, they they were almost metal. took out the PR director's <laughs> eye with one of they them. They were but metal with the crest on it and the four stars. Yeah, it was, it, was, it was pretty cool, and you could tell that 
Philadelphia is someplace none of them will forget, regardless of whether or not it was Carly Lloyd and Julie Ertz who have a connection to the city or any of the others that didn't before this. Can we just talk about the looks on the faces of the fans in the stadium and how much they were Oh, I thought you were going to talk about the look of the face we're gonna, of the goalie from Portugal. We're going to get to Portugal, right. and we're going to get to the wave in one second. Oh, uh, here we go. But we talk about the Reverse impact role. that sports has on society and community. Yeah. And I, I saw a lot of friends on Facebook who brought their daughters and their sons. Mm-hmm. Because of the example they believe that this team sets. And this team seems to recognize that they are those role models. They put out video during the game of the players in the tunnel underneath with the little girls that were so excited to talk to with them. With their eyes bulging out of their heads. And, I mean, and the comment on the, the tweet that they put out was, this never gets old. Mm-hmm. And they seem to have that attitude. So just talk about the, the example that they are setting for the people. They're all setting an example. I mean, look, we went down and talked to some people at halftime, and and you see how excited they are to be there, to see this. They really are rock stars. I mean, very few. It, it almost reminds me of the original basketball dream team in, in the reaction that people have to them and the impact that they're having. They're definitely having more of an impact on society than the, than the dream team had. So it's just impressive to see this, and and hopefully it just carries over. Now, I do want to give you a chance to rant. Uh, you were not happy before the game because people people were selling T-shirts in the parking lot that said equal oh, pay. I didn't know you were going here. But they weren't actually going yes, to give so, the money to the players. Yeah, so so the, the, one of the big issues is that, is that this group of women is not being paid equal to the men, even though they're they're way better and, and more accomplished than them and are get, obviously getting bigger crowds than them. So there are shirts that say equal pay that are supposed to support these women to make sure that they get more money. The, I'm, I'm parking in the parking lot and those guys that are always selling the cheap T-shirts are selling T-shirts that say equal pay, but they're not giving any of the proceeds to the women that these shirts say equal pay for. You don't think it's going to accomplish the goal? All right. I, do you feel better? I gave you that chance. And One. by the way, they had a lot of those after. I always wonder, so what do they do with them afterwards? They had a lot of leftovers. I know. Uh, let's talk. Uh, the Portugal goalkeeper was entertaining. She was very animated at her team. Yeah, you seem to be very happy with her. Oh, she was hilarious. Uh-huh. From the first goal on. She didn't think so, I'm sure. Oh, it was highly She was screaming at her defenders. We we had a little difference that we talked about in the press box with other people. Um, yeah. The wave was done at the game last night. And you are generally you are generally anti anything fun at a game that is not get the game. out. Oh, now, see, you, t- take out the anti fun and just say oh, I'm against things that distract from the game. That take itself. away from the game. You're normally I well, want to watch. Well, no, that's the game. different than saying that that I'm anti fun at the game. Well, I'm, you'd prefer that those things not go on. Is that better? No, I just prefer that there's more more action and that people focus on the game. I think that's enough. But you're not anti wave. How does that happen? I'm not pro-wave. I'm not anti-wave. I'm like you. I sit on the fence with that. I'm irrationally anti-wave. I think it goes back to my inability to stand up at the right time when it was being done when I was younger. Well, it's clear. See, but But, so the slow wave is really your thing then, right? Because when you do the slow-mo wave, then you can actually catch up. I probably still wouldn't get that right. But people were talking about it in the press box then about whether or not it was acceptable at sporting events. Well, you were whining about it, so everybody had to comment on it. And then then someone actually did the wave, at which point it was pointed out, hey, you're not supposed to cheer. You're not supposed to do these things in the press box. But the wave is not a cheer. And he said, said, it's a wave. I'm not cheering. I would say it was more questioning than whining. Besides the point, anyway... So there's our wave Can I hear discussion. you question versus wine so we can all tell the difference? No, nobody wants to hear that at okay. all. Uh, let's go on to talk. We mentioned Carly Lloyd. She had some week. She went to Eagles practice and uh, kicked a couple field goals through the narrow uprights from 55 yards. Uh-huh. Boom. Conversation about whether she's going to be playing in the NFL soon. Your thoughts on the ridiculous conversation that started. Not whether she should play, <laughs> but whether she'll be able to make tackles didn't you just in the nfl you just made the comment for me that i was going to make which is it's ridiculous because look i get that there is a risk to her there clearly is if she has to tackle a guy that's that's 200 pounds it it, and and is solid rock and is coming at her at, at you know whatever ridiculous speed they're coming at her there is a risk to it 
How many times does that happen? There's a risk and, on the male kicker, okay. too, by the way. Well, that's it. And and isn't it her risk to, to take? take. It, but, so why, why is it that we're taking this opportunity away? We're not asking her to go play linebacker. We're I, not asking her to play quarterback. She's kicking. I okay, saw, and anybody that says that the kicker is the last line of defense, if the kicker is the last line of defense, there's no defense at that point. Look. They're scoring. How many times do you see a kicker f- get out of the way or give the the half-hearted attempted at tackle? Name me ten tackles that kickers have made. I c- I can o- I can only ma- name one, which is the 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 um, girthy guy who played for Penn State. I don't remember his name. It just everybody falls back on the same thing all the time. Oh, a woman will play a man's sport. Oh, they can't do that. They're going to get hurt. Like, come on, for real. Everybody's going to get hurt. Justin Tucker, in his whole NFL career, the best kicker in the league, Mm -hmm. has made five tackles in his whole professional career. Can we stop? And by the the way, did you see the Bears kicker last night? Carly could probably is a tough. She could she could probably take out. Did you see the Bears kicker last night? They still don't have somebody who can make a field goal on the wide uprights, and we're going to argue about whether or not Carly Lloyd can kick in a game. She's done it on the highest level under pressure. By, by the way, I got a solution to that whole thing that I have seen before. There are teams that have have been willing to blow a roster spot by having a person who kicks field goals and a different person who kicks the kickoffs. Uh, right? Whatever. It's silly. no, but it, but if you do that, then does that eliminate the entire thing? And and I know it. I, I know what whole... certain people on certain stations are going to say. Well, what happens if there's a flub? I think the you know, whole snap? argument is silly. If a person is willing to put themselves out there, they know the risk that they are assuming. Mm-hmm. It's them. It's their decision to make. You as a fan can choose to watch it or not. According to Sean Rodriguez, you may be entitled anyway, but. You can decide what you want to do. <laughs> wow, there was a segue. Well, uh, come on. That was ridiculous this week. What? You're anti-boo, generally. I am. So we're, we've got another thing you're anti. I, 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 it seems, <laughs> but this is totally being <laughs> twisted out of context. You're a lawyer. You know uh, that I, I am, know how to I do I am anti-booing thing. my own team in their stadium because it doesn't serve any purpose. But you were not the, opposed to the boo of Sean Rodriguez when you were there on Wednesday night. I, so for our listeners first. I will gun to a head say that I, that I found it amusing. Sean Rodriguez hit a game-winning hit yeah. the other night. Yes, I was on vacation and still watching the Phillies. Uh-huh. I don't know why. Hit a game-winning hit, decided it was his time when they put the mic in his face after how much he has struggled this season and questions about whether he should be on it the bench It was like the third time players. the mic was, to be fair, it wasn't the first two times he talked. It was like the third interview he did. Said that the fans are entitled. Jeff? Wrong word. Your reaction. <laughs> my, my reaction when he said it is, I hope that's not the word he was going for. <laughs> But he's pretty much done here in Philadelphia. He apologized the night after. Sort of. <laughs> sort of. And, and so <laughs> we were at the game, and he did not start in the game. But you and your he, son were there. He, he, came, he came up, and they booed him. But not the Seriously. whole time. No, no. So <laughs> <laughs> then he gets hit with a pitch, and everybody cheers. Oh, and, and he was okay. So oh. it w- I, I just have to say it was amusing. <laughs> God, what are we doing here? What is he doing here? I, I've been asking see, that that's for the months. Qu- see, that's the question. Apparently, he's it's your not... left-handed specialist off the bench. That's what they keep telling me. Really? They, he's the guy that can hit lefties off the bench. That's why he stays here. Mikel Franco can't play that role. And and I resent the fact that the Phillies are making me start to defend Mikel Franco, by the way. Why? Because he is what he is. He's a frustrating player who has a you lot of I talent. You hate that phrase, right? But he's not going to be more than that. He's going to annoy you when he's here. But he's, he's not here. less than that. He He's gonna, he's only going to annoy you because of his potential. Exactly. But if you just look at his numbers, his numbers are not horrible. But then he's not here because Sean Rodriguez is... It, by the way, if I if I tell you that Alec Bohm is going to come up next year and he's going to have... He, he's going to, over the next five years, average 25 home runs... 85 to 95 RBIs a season and bat 250. Are you going to be happy with that? Yes, for a first year player who's learning no, how to play. No, I said over the, the next game. five years. Yeah, I would take that. Okay, well, isn't that Mikel Franco? I don't view M- Mikel Franco uh, as a more that- seasoned player at this point. He should be progressing more. My problem no. is he oh, hasn't that progressed. That is such a crock. Why? Because that I'm giving you a five year span and saying five years. Are you okay with that? 
And you're saying yes, that you'd be okay with that production out of Alec Bowman. And I'm telling you, we've gotten that production out of Mikel Franco. Because over the life of that contract and the five years after, the likelihood yeah. is he would improve. Mikel Franco has shown no signs at this point that he's going okay, to so improve. what if he starts at 20 home runs and ends up with at 27 home runs so that it averages 25? I don't deal in hypotheticals <laughs> and can't do math on the air. So don't play these games with me. That's not very fair. It's not a game. I gave you I gave you simple math and you chose to ignore it. Stop trying to it's argue facts. It's not fuzzy facts. math. Stop trying to argue facts. Can Sorry we, about that. Can we talk about another boo this week? What? Andrew Luck. Andrew Luck retired out of nowhere Saturday night. And the first question I got from people is, did you take him on your fantasy team? <laughs> that's all that's all that that people said. Did you take him on your fantasy team? Were you surprised that Andrew Luck retired? And with that retirement, were you surprised that the fans booed? I think people are big babies. The, the, why should Andrew Luck not be entitled to... This is the right place to use it, entitled to retire. Why would they boo him? I don't know why they booed him. I, I They booed him because they found out during the game that he was retiring two weeks before the season. So? Because now they have Jacoby Brissett as their quarterback. That's why they got Jacoby Brissett. I understand that. So I don't understand what why people are upset with him because he retired because he doesn't think he could handle. By the way, do you know that in the entire time that he was the quarterback, I think it was seventh seventh round pick was like the highest pick they had in for an offensive lineman. Oh, uh, they so they never put the protection around him. That if he you're him after seven or eight seasons of getting your clock cleaned. And you say, look, I don't want to do this anymore. And by the way, all these players are coming out saying their brains are, you know, that they can't think straight. See Rob Ronkowski this week yeah. come out and talk about the pain that he played with and the head injuries. That by he the had. way, he looked like if you ever saw that Seinfeld episode that where, where Seinfeld starts to cry and he goes, what is this salty discharge? It looked like Ronk just discovered that he could cry. Well, he's allowed to talk for the first time correctly about things. He's. He's allowed to do that. Hey, Jeff, why don't we take an early break while we try and get a hold of John Bacon? And when we come back, we'll see if we can get him, and then we'll talk more about what's going on. Stick with us. Sports lets people live their dreams, overcome obstacles, and achieve goals. But what's your unimaginable? Do you want to be a part of something bigger than yourself? To push your limits? The A Fatty clothing brand believes we're all capable of going far beyond we previously imagined. To overcome your obstacles and achieve your goals. Life gives you the chance to push harder dream bigger and to do whatever it takes to conquer the unimaginable and to do it with a fatty on you the original street leisure clothing brand taking you into the weekend with the latest news in the world of sports with the biggest names on and off the field it's the heart of sports each and every friday at 4 p.m on 610 espn with former players, reporters, and commentators like Adam Schefter, John Runyon, Keith Jones, Trey Thomas, and Doug Glanville, Jason Springer and Jeff Cohen cover the agony and ecstasy of fandom while weaving in conversations about the impact of sports on society. That's the heart of sports, Fridays at 4 p.m. Welcome back to the heart of sports with Jason Springer and Jeff Cohen. Jeff, are you ready to talk some college football? I absolutely am. Did you find somebody who knows more than me about college football to talk? Well, that should because be, I know you're not going to th bounce. That stuff shouldn't on me. be hard, but this guy knows a lot about. Okay, college football. bring him on. So I think we have John U. Bacon on. John, hello there. Hey, how you doing? Doing all right. We've made it work. Thank I'm you. I'm calling you from the uh, the branch office phone uh, of the local steak place in Ann Arbor. How about that? Oh, which which place? Black Rock, new place. Oh, I haven't been there yet. Jeff, Jeff's now going to have will, to visit I, that. I he... will be there next week for the Michigan Army game, though. Yes, he'll be out and there. I'll be up north, and I'll miss you. So how oh. about that? Well, Jeff, Jeff's going to follow you around until he gets you. Don't worry. Well, <laughs> you'll be out, I believe, promoting a book, because you have a book coming out on September 3rd called Overtime, Jim Harbaugh and the Michigan Wolverines at the Crossroads of College Football. And, and I saw Doug Brinkley actually call this book one of the best insider football books ever written. How's that make you feel? Uh, uh, maybe that was a good day. Trust me. <laughs> yeah. Doug, Douglas Brinkley has won about every award you're going to win. So uh, that one felt very good, to say the least. Uh, lucky break there. And getting good reviews on ESPN, Sporting News, and places like that. So if you care about college football, this is a good book for you because we get behind the scenes and find out how the players actually feel, talk to their parents, even get the staffers involved from the nutritionist to the strength coach, recruiting guys, video guys, how the whole machine actually works. And it really is quite a – Quite a thing to see. 
I, I thought, look, I, I, I thank you because I, I read an advanced copy of it, and, and it was incredible to, to kind of see the inner workings of everything that went on. And, and as a guy who went to Michigan and follows Michigan religiously, it, there were so many things in there that I, that I hadn't seen or hadn't heard about, and it really kind of changed my opinion of, of some of the players like Rashawn Gary. Um, what made you choose this topic? Uh, I thought I was done writing football books, college football books. I've done well with a book called The Great Halifax Explosion, which came out two years ago. Uh, a dramatic story, which is knocking around Hollywood right now, and bestseller set was good to do. But uh, I well, felt if you're like. Lo- wait, the, if you're looking for a leading man, Jason's your guy. He's so, ge- uh, he's Jason, so generous. He's so generous. Uh, yeah. The one catch of that leading role, Jason, is you get blown up. Is that all right with you? I think that's I oh, think that's that why he perfect. If, in fairness, I think that's why he nominated me. Don't worry. <laughs> can you play exploded? If you can play that, you got a good shot at this role. That, that's probably the, the, that's that's the probably best the he can do. That's probably the only thing that I can play. Don't worry. There you go. <laughs> He's very good at bombing. <laughs> this, this is how careers are made. There you go. So, uh, so I thought I was done with college football books, but this story drew me back in because I felt like the players had not gotten their say – what it's really like to be a uh, college ball player, what it means to you. And epilogue, I asked all eight players I followed, from all Americans like Rashawn Gary and Devin Bush Jr. to walk-ons to rocket science guys on the defensive side. I asked them, you know, is it all worth it? And that was, that was pretty cool. And the answers were very different. Um, but it made me feel better about college football. The the learning experience that these guys have, you, you we talk a lot on this show about the journey of the players. You really seem to get into that. Was there anything in particular that, that really moved you that you found out while writing the book? A couple things. Uh, one is that these guys are 300 pounds and they're six foot six, but they can't grow a proper beard. They're still kids. <laughs> uh, so you forget that. I mean, they're 20 years old. They, you know, they can't legally drink. They still drink. Um, but, for example, one thing. No. Scene, <laughs> uh, I know, I know. You just Prepare shattered. to be shocked. <laughs> Prepare to be shocked. This book is explosive. Um, <laughs> no, exactly. This is ball four all over again, really. <laughs> there you go. Uh, college football players seen drinking beer underage, yes. Um, but, for example, before the Ohio State game this last year at Michigan, uh, Ben Bredesen is an all-Big Ten uh, left guard in the offensive line, captain this year. Um, he lives in a football house, basically four or five other guys, one of these crappy old student ghetto homes, we call them. And his parents were in, all their parents were in for Thanksgiving because all the students are gone. You've got to be on campus, and it kind of stinks. So the parents made him a great Thanksgiving meal before the Ohio State game, after they left on the bus. The parents got together and added uh, Christmas lights all around the house. They stuffed the fridge with Thanksgiving leftovers and beer. Um, they actually cleaned the damn house. If you've been to these houses, that is heroic, by the way. It's like a hazmat team. My parents didn't want to step into my house I, when I, I lived was in college. I, li- I lived, across, exactly. from, I lived across from three offensive linemen, including Greg Skrepnik, when I was there. I, I saw what their, their apartments Skrep. looked like. Uh-huh. <laughs> yeah, so that, that, that's a very big gift. We can agree on that. Uh-huh. So these guys go down to Columbus. They lose 62-39, to 39, a historic loss. I mean, devastating. And on the way back, they're just you know beside themselves. They get off the bus around 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock at night. Uh, they're walking down through the snow to their home, and they see the lights lit up. All the neighbors are dark because all the students are gone. Um, but their lights are lit up. They open the door. Uh, they got decorations inside. They got food in the fridge and cold beer, and the place is clean. And Ben Bredesen, kind of in tears, tells his parents, you know, thanks so much. This is the worst day of my life, and now it's a little better. And that's when you realize they're not NFL athletes. It's not the Philadelphia Eagles. Um, these guys are kids, and that stuff matters. Well, we have Brandon Graham. <laughs> <laughs> BG, baby. Hey, he's a star of a previous book called uh, Three and Out. Um, his story is amazing. I'll tell you a quick Brandon Graham story. That he was only okay at Michigan the first two years. He's overweight. He's not working that hard, um, not really making it. And then uh, Mike Barwis, the crazy strength coach, came to Ann Arbor, um, and his mom got mugged in Detroit Ooh. that summer, and she – his, his mom, of course, is like him. He fights. She fights. Uh, broke her arm in the process. And all Bars had to do all year long is tell, remind him, what happened to your mom last summer? And BG was on fire for two years on wow. that basis, that he's going to get her out of that house, out of that neighborhood, and we're not going to live like this. So ask BG today what his main motivation was, and it was his mom getting mugged in the summer of 2009, I believe. Wow. wow. Yeah, that motor hasn't stopped for him either since then. That guy's awesome. Great guy, too. 
Great to be around. Love that guy. So before we get back to the players, uh, obviously part of the subject of this book is Jim Harbaugh. And and you've made a little news in that it, there's a portion of the book yes, where we Har- did. Har- Harbaugh <laughs> said it's hard to beat the cheaters in the SEC. You want to clear something no, up? No, 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 no. Yeah. Yes, I do. Yeah. Uh, so Harbaugh and I are talking about recruiting, and we're sharing the stories that I hear, you guys hear. Mm-hmm. We all hear these stories about how these schools do it. And they channel money through the churches, because no one wants to go after a church, to the players. They channel it through the parents by giving them jobs with the city or the county, which is not illegal because you can't stop that from happening. Uh, if you're a poor family especially, that's very appealing to get a job at Parks and Rec or Sanitation or some such. Uh, casino chips are now a great way to do it, to mask the money. Um, I've been hearing now about also the, the, uh, the loaner car. Bring in your banged-up 12-year-old pickup truck, drop it off at the Mercedes dealership, and while they're looking for the part, you get a 450 SL. As a loaner car for could be two, three years, those parts are hard to find, it turns out. So <laughs> <laughs> we're talking about all these ways that they do it. And then, you know, I was laughing at this because, I mean, even without even trying to find this stuff, it comes up to you anyway. Uh-huh. And Jim laughed and shrugged and with a wave of his hand said, yeah, well, hard to beat the cheaters. Talking about recruiting only, did not name any coaches, teams, or conferences. But that quote, of course, rocketed around the country last week, a few days ago. Um, it is interesting how everyone assumed he was talking about the SEC. Well, I so that's why what, that is. Well, see, that's what, so that's what, <laughs> look, we, we all know about gray shirting, especially in the SEC. Right? But, you know, people give Jim Harbaugh a hard time because he takes the team abroad once a year. But he seems to understand the rules and play within the rules. How can you, and, and, and I say the same thing about coaches like John Beeline and also the coach at Virginia, is how can, how can coaches like that compete? in this day and age, when there's all this other stuff allegedly going on. Uh, exactly. And that my whole point of this, one of the points of the book is, look, if the rules matter, then if cheating is allowed, then just say that and allow cheating. You know, pay the players or whatever. Make it what it is. Uh, if cheating is not allowed, if you're not allowed to pay the players, then make it matter. What I find amazing right now is the NCAA has no interest at all in catching anybody and the FBI investigation of basketball proved that. The FBI did your job for you, and you still don't care. Um, and my theory on that is they used to be the sheriffs of college football, and now they're the saloon keepers. And guess what? There's a lot more money in saloon keeping than there is in being the sheriff. So they don't want to catch you. And too often I think the national media gives the guys doing this stuff a pass because they want these coaches on their shows. Uh, You've got to get them on. Um, and the NCAA's worst nightmare is Louisville basketball. You win a national title, and you've got to give your banner back, so now you don't have any champion at all. And that's the worst Yeah, and I was at that guys. game. I want a banner. He complains about that <laughs> yeah. almost every couple weeks. We're good for a je- – actually, what he, he doesn't necessarily want the banner back for Michigan. If the game didn't happen, he wants his plane flight my money and hotel back. stay that's right. back. <laughs> <laughs> well, a great line I got from uh, a friend I'll keep nameless, but – because he didn't want to be associated with this quote. However, <laughs> the UNC ruling. The UNC ruling, uh, the NCAA gave them a free pass because the theory was very stupidly, yes, these classes are fraudulent, they're no-show, someone else writes the paper, you get a grade for nothing, and so on. But because they're available to the entire university, it's not an athletic problem. What? It's like, how, what? Exactly. That's insane. And that's in the book. So on that basis, and you might recall with Louisville basketball, Rick Pitino, whom I've interviewed, and I liked him a lot, so I guess I was fooled by the whole thing, but... Um, They were caught uh, hiring prostitutes for their players. So by the NCAA's logic, if they had hired prostitutes for the entire student body, no problem. (laughs) But their problem was it was a basketball benefit, and there's where you break the rules. You see, is the NCAA so so Louisville's just got to you know expand its program? Is is the NCAA equipped to police this at this point, or? Is it have they just thrown their hands up and say, well, we can't do it, therefore law enforcement's going to have to do it, or a reporter's going to have to break the story and but then law, we'll investigate? But law enforcement it. did it. They did it with this whole thing with with, with what went on in Louisville and what's the the Adidas thing. Why and they, they still don't care? Well, that that's what's amazing. We keep hearing about all this stuff that was going on, and and there doesn't seem to be any consequence to all of it. And if I were co- if I were like an athletic director of an uh, of of sneaker company A. And a, t- and a player from Sneaker Company A was funneled to a different college as, as an AD or a coach of another school that was also had a contract. I'd be upset about that. So why are they not even internally upset amongst themselves? 
Uh, they got a good thing going, I guess. What is amazing, though, is the honor among thieves that these guys never rat on each other. Um, so that's one of the aspects. And Jeff, your sorry, Jason, your earlier question is valid. It'd be it'd be undeniably difficult to do this kind of work. However, they've shown no appetite for even trying. And you go back 30 some years uh, to Bo Schimbeckler, the legendary coach at Michigan during that time. Um, and he had a coach in New Jersey who wanted $5,000 per his two stars. Now, 5000 bucks is chump change now, obviously. Now it's a half million dollars. Uh, but that's what the guy wanted. So Bo got him on tape saying this on the speakerphone with his coaches witnessing. And he's going to send it off to the NCAA. And he asked Joe, per- Joe Paterno what's going to happen. And Joe Paterno said nothing because they don't care. And Bo said, ah, oh, that can't be true. So he mails it in to the NCAA headquarters. He calls them up to let them know it's coming in, all this stuff. Not one response ever to the whole thing. Even in the mid-'80s, they didn't care. So what's amazing is when you find a program that seems to care, and Michigan seems to be in that category, I'm guessing Notre Dame, Northwestern, Stanford, but the list is not that long, it seems to me, um, who's doing it the right way. You know, why are they doing it the right way? No, nobody rewards them. The NCAA does not reward them. And the media does not reward you for doing it clean because they want, you know, Alabama to be on their show. Um, so, and it's hard to investigate these things. So what's amazing is that anybody to this day even tries to do it the right way is incredible. And, and John, that leads me to another, another part of your book. You talk about a, a five-star recruit, Daxton Hill, who had committed and decommitted and then committed. And it was back and forth between Michigan, Michigan and Alabama. One of my pet peeves is, is this idea that once these kids – and they are kids, commit, it seems like, and your book suggests, that's only the beginning of the recruiting for those guys. That's correct. Uh, joke amongst coaches is once, and we're talking about verbally committing, by the way, Right. Uh, no, no letter of intent, um, that once they've uh, verbally committed, that's when their recruiting actually kicks in, incredibly. Um, so that's when you've got to guard the guy like crazy. That's when the guys, other guys realize it'd be great. And what would feel better than to steal someone else's recruit who they're already committed to you and so on? So Daxton Hill committed after the third game of 2018, the SMU game, up in Ann Arbor, um, with his parents there. And his parents give a great quote about how they wanted more for Daxton than just the NFL. Uh, five-star defensive back might well get there. Um, they wanted the degree. They wanted the education, all this stuff. That's how Michigan can get a player like that. And then uh, December 9th, I think it was, before they go to Atlanta for the Peach Bowl, Daxton Hill texts his recruiting coordinator at Michigan and says, I'm going to Alabama. Sorry about that. Out of nowhere. And this guy's like near death, of course, because your whole career depends on these guys. Um, and they freaked out. And within a day or two, they, they talk and they said, okay, well, that's the way it is. And Sharon Moore is the coach out of Oklahoma, the assistant coach who handled this, did a very smart thing. He said, okay, you know, I'm, he's heartbroken, but if that's where you feel, I wish you the best. If you change your mind, come on back. Uh, but good luck to you. And 90% of coaches go negative in that situation, figuring that you're lost anyway. Uh, but I think that only confirms your decision to flip. So he kept the door open, and a day later he calls back and said, I was wrong, I'm sorry, I want to come back to Michigan. And they decided to keep that private because when it was public about Alabama, Michigan already, had already taken the hit anyway. Uh, so they decided to keep it quiet, don't put the kids through the whole thing again. <laughs> but then Jim Harbaugh, another coach, fly to his home in Oklahoma and babysat him the entire last day uh, of signing day. Uh, to just make sure, just you know, to make sure. Just to make sure that Nick Saban does not show up at the door. <laughs> 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 We're here first, dibs. That's uh, to make sure it all comes through. And he did come through, and that settled that. But it shows you how, you know, pins and needles this whole recruiting process really is. And it was fascinating to see it up close. Can you talk about the importance of the parents and family in this process? You, you tell a story about Rashawn Gary's recruitment that seemed interesting. Well, good. Thank you. And I'm glad that it seemed interesting. I'll put that in the back of the book. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a profound, a profound put it in, quote put it in the for me. Front of the seems book. interesting. Yeah. <laughs> well, not bad if you had to read a book, sure. <laughs> What's a book? <laughs> yeah, that's right. Thank you, Jason, for that plug. I'm there for you. Uh, yeah, you got my back, brother. I always appreciate it. Um, the, it's fascinating how the families work. I talk in this book, as I've not before, to the, I followed eight players, four offense, four defense throughout the season, some stars and some nobodies, if you will. Um, not nobodies, that's not fair, but not big names, uh, walk-ons and so on. Talk to their parents. And then you realize that, again, these are kids and how important the parents are in anybody's life. But Rashawn Gary told me, um, I said one of the worst rumors around here is that another school, which he asked me to keep nameless, uh, offered you $300,000, $100,000 a year to play at their school. 
And he leaned back and he grinned and he says, man, it was more than that. It was more than money and it was more than just one school. And he gave me that quote on the condition that I cannot name the schools. And I've stuck to that 100 percent, of course. Uh, don't worry. Don't worry. I, somebody's going to report that, that you said that it's a school. <laughs> <laughs> I know, but don't don't name any names right now. Just put your words right, in my exactly. mouth. No. That's how this goes. Uh, I've already learned that lesson 18 times. But uh, uh, but the point of that is, so how, how'd you come to Michigan? How did, you know, he pulled that up. He's dyslexic. He was diagnosed in seventh grade. His mom, with no money, got him into a dyslexic center, dyslexia center. He had to go there between school and football. So football was the reward for finishing your dyslexia lessons. Um, and he became an A student. And he was academic all Big Ten at Michigan. He took four classes a semester, which is one more than the rest of them take, taking three semesters a year. He's almost about to graduate now as it is. And he said, that, for me, is my greatest achievement, more than football. He said, I've got it. My dyslexia is so bad, I've got to look at my text messages four times before I hit send to make sure I got them right. Um, and Michigan was far more serious about academics than the other schools, and that's how they got them. But how many Rashawn Gary's can you get? You're not going to out-recruit the, the schools that are paying players. You're just not. You know, there, there's so many other things that we want to talk to you about this book. You're, but you're coming to the area sometime soon, right? I am. November 6th, I'll be in Philadelphia um, for the book tour. Um, and contact the U of M Club, the University of Michigan Club of Philadelphia. And I'm sure they can accommodate you if you want to come on down and uh, check it out. Well, we definitely with signed book concluded. We definitely will uh, try and share the information for how people can get there, and I'm sure Jeff will be waiting outside to get your autograph <laughs> on the book and and get recommendations for steakhouses. And, and just in case people missed it, the name of the book is called Overtime: Jim Harbaugh and the Michigan Wolverines at the Crossroads of College Football. It comes out September 3rd. Where can they get the book? Uh, anywhere. Uh, Amazon pre-orders are already looking quite good. It's quite strong. A local bookstore should have it, and you can also order it from them as well, Barnes & Noble. So pretty much anybody. Well, we look forward to talking to you more in the future and wish you a great college football season, and thanks for writing the book and come on and talking about it. Jeff and Jason, my pleasure. Anytime, man. You have a great one. Take care. Bye-bye. Thanks, guys. Jeff, how excited were you to just have a segment talking Michigan and football? Well, be I, honest. It, but it's more than look, it, what we made I know, it more than that. It, 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 They're the, the example that we use to you, talk about the different When you read issues. the book, don't read it as, as a Michigan, Michigan because it is it, it tells the story of college football and the good and the bad. And we didn't get into all of it, but the the, the stories he tells about the players show you the humanity of the players and, and that they're Are they better than interesting? Could I have come up with yes, a better the, word? Well, the, the, the way he tells the story, it's it's. What is that show that they used to follow before um, the Winter Classic that was on HBO? Oh. Whatever that show is, picture that that show um, where they follow the players leading up to it. This is like a book version of that, and can apply to almost every college football program, except different college football programs. Obviously, yeah. I mean, people want to make the book into Harbaugh against the SEC. You can see that that's. You know, pe- but he didn't tend- say that. No, huh? he didn't. And people want want to use things to feed their narrative. Right. I think his well, quote, people have agendas. I think his quote applies more broadly. Now, in fairness, some people would push back and say, well, look at the amount of money Michigan has to spend legally. But if you do doing it, this, but, but his point is, is there are rules. If, if there are rules, why not just follow them? Agreed. You don't Some get would the, say that within those rules, Michigan has more advantages because of the resources they have than others. Then put different rules in that, lev- that level the playing field more if you want to do I'm that. I'm just giving both sides I'm of the just, story there. Well, but it's, you. you're not. You're, you're, you're I not am. Gi- you're giving, you're these giving small the schools side cannot, the, these sc- You know and I know yeah. that these small schools have no ability to change the rules of the game they're playing. Oh, well, they have to work within well, what isn't, is there. Isn't that they why they now have, have the five super They don't have the resources to compete with some of the big boys. That's all I'm saying. Well, yeah, but that's why you now have the FBS and the FCS. That's why you have the super conferences. So the, you can't, yes, Middle Tennessee State, who plays Michigan this weekend, can't compete with them. Uh, God, I probably shouldn't have said that because I was at the Appalachian State game. Right. But, um, <laughs> should I? Why, why don't we get away from should this? I leave subject? your college Cause, football cause there because if, if they lose tomorrow, I'm not going to hear the end of it. Oh, if they so, lose, if Michigan loses tomorrow, you will never uh, hear the end of it from me on the show. But leave it there. That will be the end of me on the show because now we're going to talk some basketball. Okay. Are you ready to talk some blue coats, Jeff? I am. General Manager Matt Lilly, are you ready to talk some blue coats? 
I'm ready. Matt, how are you doing this off season? Are you getting excited? It's getting close. Yeah, honestly, I can't believe it's almost September already, but we are uh, we're very excited for the season coming up right around the corner. So this year, you know, last year you had so much going on with the construction of the new building, had to start on the road, everything was compacted. How nice is it that you can start the season off with a at home virtually completed building at home and have a normal schedule for a team this year? Yeah, we're, we're thrilled, honestly, to, like you said, to have a place that we know is going to be our, our home for the whole season and not have to worry about the logistics of, of moving midseason and not having all those road games kind of packed in at the beginning and have a more balanced schedule. Um, you know, it, it's going to be really great to have you know, a place that we know is our home base for the for the duration of the season this year. Well, not only not only are you starting the season being able to have games at home, but you in looking the schedule is out for anybody who hasn't had a chance. The schedule is out, and a lot of those home games are on weekends. How how much of a plus is it that you have a lot of these Friday night and weekend games to to kind of bring in fans and build a fan base? Yeah, we love the weekend home games. I know it's a little easier for. Uh, for people to get out and, and catch a game during the weekend. So um, at any time we can have a, a big crowd, like we'd love that. Our players definitely feed off off the energy of everyone kind of packing packing the place in. So um, schedule came out, and that's the first thing we look at is, is you know, what, what are, what's our home schedule look like, how many games are on the weekends, and we're, we're kind of happy with, with the way it shook out this year. For our fans who aren't as familiar with the G League, can you tell them a little about the timing of what goes on now? We'll talk about the open tryouts that are coming up, but what, what's your timing as you get ready for the season here? Sure. So everything at the G League level happens happens a little later than um, than the NBA because we're kind of waiting for for the NBA dominoes to fall first, and then um, you know we start shifting focus to to putting our, our roster together and, and, and heading into the season. And kind of the, the first thing for us, honestly, honestly, is these tryouts coming up where um, we, get, we get a couple weekends in, in September where we get to kind of start getting out and, and scouting talent and, and trying to find some, um, you know, hopefully some future G leaguers. So um, from the tryouts, we kind of go into Sixers camp in our world. And then that kind of flows right into G league training camp and into the G league, G league season. So, um, we're, we're kind of just getting started here. There's a lot going on with us as, as we're trying to finally start to, to shape our roster and, 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 you know, get moving. So the, the job that you have for people that don't understand it is in a developmental league, you know, minor league baseball, the general manager obviously has a different role. The players are basically selected by a major league team. And, and, and what you have to do is actually build a roster. What is this? Is your your second season doing that? What what is it like to go through that process of of going out and developing talent and going through all of that and meeting with those players? Yeah, it's it's definitely uh, a, a challenge because I think um, we, we deal with a, a really big population of players that are um, you know G League level guys, and um, it requires a lot of work to kind of to sift through those guys and, and, and identify the guys that we think are or on court fits as, as players and off court fits as as people um, to bring into our, our program and ultimately the goal is um, to find guys that can be future Sixers contributors and it, it's not it's not an easy thing to do but um, that, that's kind of what we're aiming for and you, you spoke to kind of the difference between um, you know putting putting a team together in our league versus minor league baseball and, and it is a little different the approach because we don't have we don't have the NBA rights to all of these guys so. Um, I think with that comes comes some benefits. It's a little more appealing to, to guys that play in the G League, knowing that they can get called up um, to any of the 30 teams, but it also has some challenges um, kind of on our end, trying to identify those guys and ultimately secure them to, to play for us in Delaware. We enjoyed getting to watch uh, Coach Johnson last year work with the players and develop them. We've talked with Brett Brown. He's talked about the importance that Coach Johnson has in terms of implementing some synergy from the main team to the G League so that when players do come up, they're ready. He was coaching out in the summer league this year. Can you talk a little about him and, and the importance of him within the organization? Yeah, I mean, Connor's, Connor's great. He's a, he's a young coach with a really bright future. He, he got to spend a couple of years in, in Philadelphia working really, really closely with Brett Brown. He got to absorb a lot of this kind of basketball knowledge and got to intimately know how we do things in, in Philadelphia. So, um, with, with with kind of a, a more broad goal of, of mirroring everything that, that the Sixers do in Delaware. Connor was, was perfectly equipped to step into that role last year and 
and implement that where all of our terminology is the same. All of our defensive concepts are the same. Our offensive concepts, we, we try as much as possible to, to, to mirror everything that, that they do in Philly. And then um, on, on top of that, we have kind of a, an extreme emphasis on, on development and giving Connor's background as um, in, in a development role in Philly. He was, he was ready to kind of come down and implement that kind of culture of, of putting in work and getting better every day. And I think, guys, it really paid dividends for some of our guys last year. Your role is, is to develop players to be ready for, for when the Sixers need them. What is it like for you to see guys like Shake Milton uh, and Zaire Smith, who developed under, under you, who are now going to have a bigger role with the Sixers? How proud are you when you see these guys succeed and, and do well in the NBA? It's, it's awesome, frankly. It's, it's why we do any of this. It's, it's the reason the league exists. Um, the reason that that teams invest so much, so much, you know, so many resources into it is, is to kind of get that return on the back end. You you want to create an, an environment where guys can spend time and then have this ecosystem of developing and growing and getting better, and to see it actually help guys and, and to help guys make careers and and, and make livings that, um, you know, that, that they ultimately have always hoped to do is, is really really rewarding on our, on our end. Um, and ultimately it's, it's the player success and we'll leave them to bask in it. But I, th- I think from Connor and, and my own perspective, like, um, that's, that, that's the biggest reward we get out of even doing this whole thing. So if people do want to try out for the team, you have three open tryouts, right? Where are they going to be located? Yeah. So we have, um, September 7th is our first one at the field house in Wilmington. Um, uh, following Saturday, we are in Reading, Pennsylvania. And then the final one is September 21st will we'll be in Philadelphia at Temple University. So that's the one that concerns me because Jeff has reached out to you and to Matt Murphy and your team over there because he would like me to try out. Um, I have no idea. I don't believe <laughs> well, this. Well, no, will, both of us. I don't believe but, but this. But I'm 6'4". I, I at least have something I'm 5'6 on a good day. <laughs> I don't believe this will go well. I didn't have skill when I could play, but I was practicing Papa Shot at NLBI with my family the other night. So um, can he, you tell Jeff? Well at that can either. you tell Jeff why this is a terrible idea for me, please? <laughs> I think it's a great idea. Oh, God, uh, there you go. More people on the team there to come try out. That'd be great. You're, you're not help, you're uh, not helping. You don't want me there. <laughs> so, so how uh, so how I'm many a, team I'm doctors do you right have there? there? Yeah, that's the question. How, <laughs> do you have doctors we, ready we, to assist? <laughs> we may need, we may need to bring some extra. Well, we. Uh, we look forward to continuing to publicize what you guys are doing and, all season and, long. But before, for the, for the people that aren't us, so don't worry, I'll sign you up. Um, how do people <laughs> sign up for the the uh, the tryout if they want or want to participate in it? Yeah, so the it, it's really easy. the The registration is on the website. You basically pick which date, you know, if it's going to be one, two, three, whatever. Pick which date you'd like to register for, and and put in a little bit of your basic info, and everything is right there on the website, and it'll be be ready to go kind of day off. What, right. what basic info would you like like for Jason? <laughs> blood, <laughs> blood type. <laughs> for when I need to be resuscitated. Uh, I'll, don't worry. I'll start stretching and practicing now. So I only hurt myself slightly within the first 10 minutes. But uh, <laughs> we, uh, we'll definitely publicize what you guys got going on and look forward to getting ready with the start of the season and following what you guys are doing down there. Wish you the best of luck with everything. And uh, always appreciate you giving a couple minutes to come on and talk about the team. Great. Thanks, guys. Have a great Thank one. You, Have a good holiday. Oh, Jeff, I, I thought that he was going to say this is a terrible idea. And no, man. I it, shouldn't do it. It is on. <laughs> that did not go as I expected. September 21st will be the best day this show has ever had. You had to like talk to them beforehand. I, so I did he, not. I did not. It, we just all know it's a great idea. No, it's we no, have, it's, You have so much untapped potential, and you, and we're going to bring it out in you. I disagree. <laughs> what are you going to talk about now? We got about 10 minutes left in the show. We've got Phillies, Eagles, and Union. I just you... want to keep talking about what you're going to be doing. About embarrassing me? Yeah. Now, I have a basketball hoop in my driveway, so and it's a 10-foot one, not like the Fisher-Price <laughs> one you have in your basement. So if it, 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 By anytime the way, you... the reason there's a Fisher-Price one is because I have a two-year-old. Thank you. No, Can you that, clarify no, that, that? that? That's 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 your excuse. Don't for, try that, to make That's it. like people who like Pixar movies and then take, have a kid just oh, so they can go see believe them. Believe me, have Having a kid makes everything else excusable. Right. But I didn't buy the Fisher Price basket until oh, we had Oh, okay. All right. <laughs> Just to clarify. Uh-huh. 
but I can dunk on that one, which is well, rather the, good for well, the ego. The good news for you is that mine's adjustable. It has a little thing on the back. So I still won't so, be able to reach it. I know, but the, <laughs> but the kids in my neighborhood will often bring it down so they can dunk. So <sighs> I expect you to be over there morning, noon, and night. So in addition to prepping for the show now, we're going to have practice in your driveway? That's right. God, we'll have some Rocky on? music playing. Oh, yeah. None of this is good for uh -huh. me. Okay, let's get back to if some If I don't sports. see you running before as I leave for work past my house and when I come home, then I will know that you are not taking this serious and that you and Allen Iverson have one thing in were, common. <laughs> were you surprised that I had the Eagles fourth pregame uh, on my phone while we were at the women's soccer game no, last night, No, you're degenerate. <laughs> I, I didn't gamble on it, Jeff. No, I, I, I just watched it. <laughs> I didn't say gambling degenerate. I just said sports degenerate. <laughs> So, any news out of it was this? six nothing. It was six nothing. Okay, so <laughs> why did you have it game. on? It, are there any? It, we were in the Plea Eagles press box, and there was something other than the and Eagles. They, did, in they front didn't of even us. have it on there. Right, <laughs> that's when you know it's a bad uh -huh. game. Is there anything that you think is newsworthy? Will anybody make this team that you didn't <laughs> think would make the team before the preseason started? Yeah, Josh McCown. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Smarty. <laughs> Is anybody Am, gonna, uh, that's that is a correct answer? Does, does Greg Ward make the team? Who cares? What do you mean? Who cares? What what, what, what position do you want him at that, that is so important? Uh, I think he's a better wide receiver than Mac Collins. I, I don't, don't know if he'll play special teams, but he's a better wideout option. Look, uh, no. the best ability is availability, and Mac Collins hasn't been able to stay on the field in three years. Is he healthy now? I don't know. He they say he's healthy every year, and then he plays like a what snap. Did they and he's say, out. What did they say this week? He's healthy, right? For now, okay. they've said he's healthy other times. Well, anybody can get injured. He had a two-year hernia. Okay. Like, <laughs> like you got a guy So tell him not to lift anything <clears throat> So don't give games. me the talent argument that he's a better player. If he's not on the field, Greg he's not a better Ward player. Greg Ward is not going to make a difference between whether you make the playoffs or don't or whether you make the Super Bowl or not. I didn't say that. I okay. asked you. Who, because the only point of the preseason. You asked me if I care. The only point of the preseason <laughs> is the guys that are 46 to 53 on the roster. Basically, right. four, the top 45 mm -hmm. guys are set before they go into camp. So if you're going to tell me, does the preseason mean anything? If you watch the Eagles play, you're looking at Hall and Taylor I on defense, watch and the you're Eagles looking at Greg play. Ward on offense. Those uh, are the three players. I know, but I can't assess anything from last night's game because there was an electric event in here that I thought last night that I thought was more important than Which watching we talked the about Eagles the versus the Jets. Start of the show, and we're moving towards the start of the season. I know, season but I can't. Week. I can't evaluate what happened last night in a six nothing game. All I can tell you is it was six nothing by against the Jets. People want well. It was three two in the uh, Detroit Lions game for a while. Yeah. So, would you make a trade for Jadavian Clowney? Or are you happy with who you have on the defensive rotation? I don't know because I, I'm not sure what you would have to give up. Remember, Jadavian Clowney did not stop. Uh, you're going to make fun of that I did, couldn't pronounce it. No, not at all. Uh, <laughs> what I was going to say <laughs> well, is hold from on, Miami, it looks like they're all, they're asking a number, a first round pick, and Laramie no. Tunsil. That's a lot. Uh, well, the the other problem with it is he never signed his tender, I don't think, which means that if you get him, you only get him, you cannot sign him to a longer term deal. You can only get him for the one year. So the question is do you want him for the one year if there's a first round pick and a substantially good player as well? If if it's just a first round pick, I probably would do it because you're that close to a Super Bowl. But if it's also going to involve detracting from your team or subtracting from your team, you may not want to do it. And so the, the devil's obviously in the details of what what person would be involved in a trade like that. You mentioned Josh McCown as a player who's going to make the roster that wouldn't before the preseason. Are you surprised that they're, the Eagles are going to let him continue to coach high school football during the season and go home on Fridays? Well, he won't get hurt. Uh, I didn't ask but, if he's going to get but, hurt. Uh, but I asked if you're surprised that they're going to let Yes, their... I, I, think, I think that they should have said, look, you got to be committed to this. Uh, that surprised me. Yes. He's uh, apparently back tonight to coach at the high school, and then he'll fly back tonight. It's in Charlotte, so apparently it's not I, too I just, far. I just don't know. I don't care how experienced he is. I don't see how he's coming in late. He wasn't here for OTAs and stuff like that. So why in the world would he not want to be here to get his timing down? Because you don't get a lot of reps as a backup anyway. If you're the Eagles, do you, may, do you entertain if you know Frank Reich worked with Nate Sudfeld when he was here mm -hmm. with Andrew Luck retiring they're looking for a quarterback do you entertain trading him now that you have McCown here trading Sudfeld or trading Sudfeld no do you, you still no because it? it's only one year so so, would, so Sudfeld oh, and by the way who, uh, Sudfeld's hurt right the 
but he's so, got a broken wrist. But yeah, so uh, he'll be healthy in like week two. Maybe. And it's not his throwing wrist. Maybe. <clears throat> yeah, but but there's a there's a problem when it's your non throwing wrist because you, it's usually the wrist that you're trained I to mean, fall on. Clayton Thorson's look terrible. So you know it's not like unlike that. Daniel Jones, who's a star for the Giants because he went four for four in the fourth preseason game. Yesterday. I told you about my favorite picture of them I in know, the locker room <laughs> last week. Let's talk a little soccer before we get off the air again. We'll close with the Union. Yeah. I'm going to leave the Phillies there because they're the Phillies. Uh-huh. They're maddening. They drive me nuts. Uh, the Union had a big win last week against DC United. Probably the best atmosphere they've had at the home stadium in a long, long time. They're going to sell out the rest of their games. I would think so. Mm-hmm. And tomorrow night is a huge game for them against the defending champions. The defending right? champions yep. uh, at home mm-hmm. need to try and defend your home without home. without Bedoya. So let's talk about that. So their captain is I, out. I hate yellow cards and red cards. Yeah, you just don't like rules. Yeah, um, oh, really? W- w- what was I complaining about before? Rules. Rules. Okay. Both teams are tied in points at 48. Atlanta holds a game in hand, mm-hmm. and the first tiebreaker at total wins are at 15 to 14. Uh, is this... And the first, the number one seed gets a bye. Is right? this... This is why I ask. But there is a FIFA break before that. So every team will get a rest. Mm-hmm. No, We were talking about this last night at the game with JP Della Camera briefly. No team will go into the playoffs... Having played right before it, they'll have a break from FIFA. Right. So actually, somebody was saying it's sort of like the NFL where you get two weeks off with a bye, and will you come out not as focused or as cohesive as you were with the hot team? Will somebody get picked off? Mm-hmm. But is this the biggest game that the Union have had in, in their tenure history? I don't know. I, I'm not a historian of them to figure out it, but I know it, it's a huge game. It's not just that they're the defending champs. This, this is a chance to assert that you are here, that you are real. And they can't, they can't which was another thing that we talked about. In, you can't lay an egg in this game. No. This game, the next couple weeks really matter because they're also then playing LAFC, which is they have a very the best tough schedule to yeah. close. And their next two weeks are extremely important in determining whether they are in place for a buy or in first place for the league. Right. So you want to announce we're here. This this is your ch- starting this week is your chance to announce the union is for real. They are it is absolutely yeah. their chance. Casper Shabilko, our guest this week. The good luck continues from the show, Jeff. Right, like you you like to take credit for everything good that happens to everybody after they talk on the we, show. Right, we do have an amazing track record of we are the reverse of the SI jinx. Okay, so yeah. what happened last week to Casper that after he was on the show? He scored the first goal. And then he signed an extension. Yeah. So he's going to be here through pretty oh, much yeah, 2021. So, see, I was only going on the f- on the pitch. You're actually saying that we're responsible for them getting cash, too, huh? Well, you take responsibility for everything. I wasn't taking responsibility for anything. Uh, you know what? When you make the blue coats, I will not take responsibility for that. Oh, God, there is right. no chance of yeah. me making the blue coats, and you know that's the case. Jeff, we've got another minute left. What do you want to close with? What does Labor Day make you think of in sports? I'm heartbroken. Why? Well, there's lots of people. I'm, I'm sure people out there know why I'm heartbroken. But one of the reasons that I'm heartbroken is because this is the end of the minor league baseball season. I, yeah, I was going to ask. Is September like a sad time for you? Because a lot of people get excited it that it's football season. Yeah. But you and seem I mean, to be I, a ba- I, You're a football guy, but you're, well, a, you're a minor football. league baseball guy. Yeah. At heart. And so like you have mixed emotions now, don't you? Yeah, it's it's the it's the end of a season and you know, now that we cover them and, and see these guys develop, it's it's just so much fun. I mean, we'll be still following the Arizona Fall League, but it's it's just not the same, not the Yeah, you able tried to, to get me to go to Arizona last night. I don't think uh, that my uh, wife's gonna be down for that. I'm still gonna try. Last thoughts. Thanks so much for joining us this week. Make sure to join us next Friday night to help you start your weekend in style. Have a great one and we'll talk to you next week. Bye bye.